weather's a lot nicer than it is back in Boston, but also because I'm really excited to be here talking to this group. I love meditation, I love research, and I'm really excited that there's a whole room full of people who share these interests, and I hope that we can get some really interesting discussions going. Before I begin, I'd just like to add to Tucker's intro and tell you a little bit about how I became interested in this type of research in the first place. Uh, when I was studying neuroscience in college, I took a class with Professor Harold Broth in which it was entitled An Introduction to Contemplative Studies. And the class taught us about the mind from you know, the third person perspective. We read the psychological, cognitive science, and neuroscience literature. But then we also learned how to study the mind from a first person experiential perspective. So we, there were there's a meditation lab component, and we met uh, three days a week in the mornings and were taught all these different meditation techniques. And I thought it was a really amazing way to learn about the mind, and so I was hooked on that, and, and since then I've been pursuing um, every opportunity I can get to learn about meditation research. <coughs> so now I'd like to get just a sense of everyone who's here. Um, first of all, by show of hands, who's read the relaxation response to the book? And I'm not familiar with the I've read it, but familiar. Familiar, okay. And how many of us would consider ourselves researchers? And clinicians? We can vote more than once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and how about meditators? Okay. No, I won't leave anyone behind. Uh, <laughs> I'm assuming no knowledge about any of these, uh, but we're going to talk about some pretty exciting um, findings in all of these, but I, I will make sure to give background so that um, everyone knows what's going on. Finally, I'd just like to take a moment and get a sense of why everyone came out tonight. Uh, it's Thursday night. I'm sure there are lots of other things you guys could be doing. So this, if, if some people would just be willing to volunteer and tell me you know, what you're hoping to get out of this talk, why you, you come to these in general. Uh, I think sort of it's important to, to get into that mindset so that we can all be on the same page. So if a couple people want to share. Yes. I think the interface between Western science and uh, uh, Eastern subjective psychology, if you will, the meditation tradition is maybe the most important development for the future of the human race. Cool. So, so we already have someone who's convinced this is great. Um, <laughs> so that makes my job easy. All right. <laughs> yes. Me. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm interested in the science because uh, it's a good media of communication to kind of convince the skeptical mind in the in our Western world here. So it kind of gives it a good basis for communicating meditation in general. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. The really, um, you know, understanding the science behind it is, is an, I think, an important language and one which, you know, can help <coughs> us, whether we're coming from a meditation background or science background, can really um, enrich our understanding. Yes? Um, because Herbert Brenton was one of the pioneers getting all this started, and I wanted to see where things were at now. Great. Yeah, so I'll take us through some history, and then I'll get into some of the, the more recent stuff that we've done. That was pretty much it. Yeah. The, the, the name is quite famous, and my awareness of his work pretty much stopped when I closed the last page of relaxation response, and I really haven't kept abreast of what he's doing, so it'd be nice to hear where did that point him, and how did he study it. So much of what we have seen now uh, is as um, people taking up meditation, but I haven't seen somebody keeping it in the lab. So what's he doing in the lab? Yeah, great. Well, I'll definitely be covering that. And last, yes. Um, the three of us, we are in a wellness uh, book group for cancer survivors. And this week, we happened to be, this was on, the book was on our schedule. So we were reading this. <laughs> <laughs> and as we said, Sue comes to this, this is our first time, and she's like, Guess what the talk is on? So we felt it was just destined. To <laughs> wow. That is exciting. And, and so, yeah, tell me if, if there's anything from the history that um, you want me to discuss or 
that I don't mention in the overview that you think is interesting. Uh, so I, I like this format. I, I hope that um, you can feel comfortable stopping <coughs> throughout with questions, bringing up things that you want to delve into more deeply. Um, so you know, I have my outline here, but I really want to make this the talk uh, for everyone, for all of us. So yes, please feel free to stop me throughout. All right, so if you remember nothing else from this talk, I want you to remember that the relaxation response is a physiological state. Uh, we're not talking about a technique, and in fact, it might even sound, sometimes I'll say, we're going to practice an RR. Um, that's the type of terminology we still throw around, even at the Benson Henry Institute, but it really is, it's not a technique it is the physiological state that results from different forms of meditation, um, tai chi, yoga, practices like that. So it's, it's the physiological response. And why this is important? Well, everyone in the room can benefit from understanding, I think, why, just what's going on when we meditate. What is it that's happening in our bodies? How can this help us um, in our own lives? How can it help? patients or clients that we work with. And um, so having sort of a more, more full, a fuller understanding can really, um, I think, enrich our practice. What I'm gonna talk about first, some history of the relaxation response, then talk about the response itself, the physiological state. Get into the Benson Henry Institute, what, what we have going on there guide you through elicitation of the relaxation response, how I would introduce it in a research study, what our clinicians use when they're, when they're introducing it first to patients, and then talk about some, of, some research findings, a couple recent papers, and something that's ongoing. So this is Dr. Benson. Uh, he looks a little bit different now. <laughs> uh, and so he, this work started in the 60s when Dr. Benson was doing some research on hypertension. It was actually conditioning with animals. And so he would go through a classical conditioning experiment and he could, um, he was able to get animals to increase their blood pressure by sort of just rewarding them, giving them treats by um, whenever their blood pressure increased. And so some transcendental meditators heard about this research and said, hey, we have a way that we can affect our blood pressure and heart rate. Um, why don't you study us? And so Dr. Benson at first was very reluctant to do so because in the 60s at Harvard Medical School, being associated with transcendental meditators <laughs> wasn't the cool thing to do. So he, he was very reluctant to do so, and it took him a while before he agreed. But when he did, um, he would sneak them in to the lab late at night <laughs> the door, so that no one else would know. And, um, and eventually what came out of these experiments were published papers um, describing this, this physiological state that resulted from transcendental meditation. And oh, just I think a really cool tidbit is that the, the room that these experiments were conducted in was actually the same room where Walter Cannon had described the fight or flight response previously. Oh. So there's some more fate. <laughs> Just the, you know, I guess it was a good room to, to discover these types of states. But uh, he, so described the relaxation response and um, you know, his colleagues at Harvard tried to kick him out of Harvard for doing so. 